Hi everybody, my name's Andrew Kogashal, and I've been doing 3D modeling and look development for this game's Scale. Now, if you're not familiar with Scale, the basic concept is you have this device that you're carrying around, and what it allows you to do is literally change the scale of objects in the environment. As you can see, you make a tree small, you can pick it up, you can rotate it, place it somewhere else, and continue to scale it. So this is a pretty neat mechanic that lends itself to a lot of interesting situations, but it also had a very interesting look development requirement. So unlike some games where you can do light mapping, this game has to be very dynamic, meaning objects can move, so their texture can't be influenced by where they are at any one point in the game. We also wanted to have a very stylized, faceted look to all the geometry. This is interesting because when you're scaling objects, their size becomes less important and their shape becomes what defines them. And having really faceted geometry is a way for us to really show the shape of something in kind of an exaggerated way. If you look at these leaves, they don't look soft, they look chiseled or faceted like they're made out of stone. And it's a really interesting look. So in addition to that faceted look, there's a very interesting sort of lighting scheme we're doing on everything. You can see there's a lot of indirect light but it's not baked in, it's being done with a shader. There's also a lot of shading in the crevices done with ambient occlusion. And if you're unfamiliar with ambient occlusion, I'll explain that later and show you how to achieve it in Maya. So now that you have a sort of basic overview of what the look development is in this game, let me take you to Maya and show you how we accomplish some of these things. So here we are in Maya 2014. Now let's talk a little bit about surface normals and topology. Now first off, topology is basically the flow of edges, vertices, faces that make a mesh. So as you can see, there's long edges running in what we call edge loops in two directions. And this forms a very regular, um, what's sometimes called a quad topology. If I were to triangulate this, it would have a different topology. And if I were to reduce it, it would still have a much different topology. So even though the volume is approximately the same, the way that volume is formed has changed. Now if I revert back to my original sphere and compare it to this one, you can see that they definitely look different. So what's different about them? Well, obviously the one on the right looks much more faceted in that you can see individual faces. But if you look at this one on the left, you can't really tell where one face begins and the next one ends. So the reason for this is that in 3D geometry, um, and in 3D modeling, there's this concept of a surface normal, which is uh, a vector perpendicular to the surface that is the direction that light is bouncing off. Now, if you look at the sphere here, this is actually what the sphere would look like in real life. Because it's not a continuous smooth sphere like this, it's just made of these very small number of faces. But if you're making a game that has a ball, you obviously don't want to look like it was chiseled like this. You want it to look like this. Uh, and the difference is that the normals are told to blend between faces here so that the lighting looks continuous rather than discrete like it does here. Now as you can see, I can grab some of these faces and say let's make those hard normals. So now some of them look that way. So ironically, this is not how people usually like to make things look in 3D unless they're doing something like a cube. If we look at a cube, that looks very natural. Now if I soften its normals, it looks pretty weird. So with very angular things you want hard normals, but with softer, more organic things you probably want them to be soft. Now for our game, because we wanted this particular style, we're actually going with this more hard normal look and not what you would usually do. Now in addition to that, we already talked about topology. so. If you can see each one of these faces, the faces sort of become a texture, and the topology becomes a texture. And that, you know, really contributes to the style. But these edge loops that run sort of in this grid-like pattern are kind of boring. So what can we do about that? Um, one thing we can do is we can grab something like our cut face tool, and just maybe put some other lines in here. Um, not a great solution, but it is a way to break it up. But one thing I like to do 
is reduce and smooth. Now, it's funny, we're actually using Maya's kind of weak ability to do reduction to get random geometry. So let's say I put a couple random loops in here. Say reduce, maybe triangulate, reduce again. Mm, that's probably too much. But then smooth, you can see now that we have a very random topology. Now, if you're making something like a piece of fruit or a ball or whatever, having this random topology wouldn't be really that advantageous. But when we go to harden the normals, you can see now we've created a very interesting texture out of the geometry. So you can see how this works in sort of an abstract way. Let me show you it on a model that we're actually using for the game. So here's an object that you saw earlier when I was demoing the game. This is sort of an oak tree, I imagine, and it's obviously very stylized but you can see some of the principles I was talking about being applied to it. Now there's not a lot to say in terms of the modeling, but we want to export this object to Unity to use in the game. But before we do that, we want to set it up to have ambient occlusion maps. So if you're not clear what ambient occlusion is, I can show you a little picture here. Uh, this is an environment I made using only ambient occlusion. And what's interesting about it is there's no light sources being used here. Basically, the more tucked away an area is, the darker it becomes. And the more exposed it is to the ambient environment, the brighter it is. And it's a really neat way to sort of shade things in a way intrinsic to the object, rather than dependent on the scene or lighting. So that looks pretty cool. And we want to do something similar for the tree. So we're going to pop this open, and we're going to go to our hypershade. And I'm going to move it over here, and we're going to get this shader called ILR OCC Sampler. It looks like we already had one, but oh well. And we're going to put that on the tree. So if you're familiar with Maya, but the shader seems unfamiliar, it's because it goes with a rendering plugin called Turtle. Uh, Turtle is an evolution of the same software I believe was used on Mirror's Edge, and also is what's known as Beast in Unity. Um, but it's a different version that works in Maya. So if I go to the plugin manager, I can check here that Turtle's loaded. Cool. And then I can go to my render settings. Now I used to use Mental Ray, but Turtle is such an amazingly cool renderer that I've been using it pretty exclusively now. And one of its strengths is baking maps to textures, which is really useful for video games. I believe that's why Autodesk put it into the uh, cheaper LT version of Maya is you know, it's really trying to leverage that platform of going from Maya to video game development. So if I go here, uh, check my sample rate, everything looks fine. Um, there's obviously documentation for Turtle that's worth looking at if you're interested. But I'm going to hit render, and you can see sort of the same effect I was showing with the room. The darker areas here where the um, leaves get sort of bunched up uh, transition into very open spaces here where they're light. But if I were to say what's the light source on this object, you couldn't really tell me, because there isn't one. So this looks good, but we want to bake it to a texture. Now to do that, we want to go to our UV Texture Editor, and move that over here. And right now you can see that it's all laid out in 2D. Uh, sometimes, however, it won't be. So if I were to say, have a planar map applied to it, and I show you how it looks. You might say, oh, that's cool because it looks sort of like the tree. But as you can see, a lot of these faces are overlapping. So you can't really use a texture because no one face owns one pixel on the texture. So it needs to be unique. Now, you can do this by hand, but for this type of thing, I wouldn't recommend it. I would try to do automatic mapping under Create UVs. And I don't want to create a new set because we're only going to use one UV channel. And hit Apply. All right, so that creates a new UV map for us. And as you can see, the whole tree's been laid out again in 2D. I can always go shade my UVs to sort of see the volume of them. And I can also say Polygon Layout. And sometimes this is, you can see it does a little better job of packing the UV shells. So that's cool. Uh, that looks really good. So we're going to do two things now. First thing is we're going to make sure that our OBJ exporter is loaded. 
and OBJ is a very bare bones mesh format for exporting between different programs. Click OBJ export. And actually before I do that, I want to export it with these materials. So I'm going to apply the green one and then I'm going to click on the branch, apply the bark back to it. Okay, that looks good. Cool. So then I go to export selection. I should actually go to the option box here. That'll give me the OBJ options. Go to OBJ and make sure materials is turned on. Cool. And then on the desktop, I'm just going to call this tree. All right, great. And we'll come back to that later. So now if I select this, I want to put that ambient occlusion shader back on it. that and we go to the render settings and instead of rendering we're going to do baking so baking renders but to the texture and then under baking we say the target should be the selected object uh, I'm going to turn off some of these options for edge dilation and I'm going to make the size 1024 squared so that's a pretty standard texture size map all right, and we can say PNG, but I think we'll have an option to save it anyway. So now, when I hit render, you can see that instead of seeing our screen, I'm seeing the texture itself being rendered. And this will apply to that OBJ that we just exported. So sometimes it takes a little while, but this is pretty fast. I would say that Turtle is a fairly fast rendering engine, so yeah. Okay, cool, that's done. So now we say save image, put it on the desktop, and I'm going to call it tree AO and save. Now I'm going to pop open Photoshop and I'm going to go to the desktop, find it. And one thing you notice is the areas that don't have texture are just sort of empty space here. They have no alpha channel um, or they have a transparent alpha channel. So that's cool, and I guess there'd be no reason to really fill that in, except that sometimes with MIP maps, the texture gets smaller, and that can cause weird seam issues. So one solution I found for this is I found this uh, set of plugins called Flaming Pair, and particularly this one called Solidify C, which will expand the texture into the transparent areas. So I run Solidify C, and as you can see, it fills it in, and now it's more continuous. So I'm going to save that, and we have our AO. So we should be good to bring this all into Unity next. I've created a sample project to show you just the very basic things we're going to do with the art pipeline. So first thing I'm going to do is create a plane as a ground, just sort of so we have some reference here. And I'm going to drag this tree OBJ we created and move it up. There we go. Cool. So right now I can look. There's actually no light in the scene, so it just sort of looks like this. And that's obviously not a very interesting art style. So first thing I'm going to do is create a sun. This is a directional light. And I'll move it over here. And then I'm going to turn on shadowing. So I'm going to do soft shadows. Cool. And I think I'll paint these up a little bit. Cool. All right, so even with that, things look a little bit more interesting. We're getting to see the faceted look for sure, um, so that's coming through, but it's still not that interesting in my opinion. So what else can we do? Well, if we look at the back of the tree, the problem is all of the areas that aren't in direct light are just flat. Um, and if I were to go to our rendering settings, you can see we have an ambient light. And if I turn that off, then the areas that are not in direct light are actually just black. So let me adjust this light color a little bit, make it a little brighter, a little more yellowy orange. Cool. Now, as we know from just being around in real life that dark areas on a sunny day aren't pitch black. There's a lot of ambient indirect light bouncing around. So there's a few different ways you can approach this, but the best solution we've found is to use a plugin called the Marmoset Shaders, a Marmoset Toolkit, I believe. And it's a really, really cool set of shaders that allows you to use cube maps to light sort of the indirect areas of the object. 
Uh, and you can get this on the asset store, so it's definitely look worth checking out if you're interested in this sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop in the prefab for the Marmoset Sky. And as you can see, there's different cube maps here for lighting. These are actually probably not the best um, because they're indoors. So I'm going to switch to an outdoor set of cube maps. And they also have a lot of cool tools for taking HDR panoramas and converting them into these different cube maps that have different blurry reflections and diffuse sort of contributions. Uh, cool. All right, so we have our sky set up. So now I'm going to select this material. Um, actually, there's two for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I'm going to say Marmoset Diffuse IBL. All right. And now you can see on the green material that in the shadowy areas, it doesn't look black. It actually is kind of more interesting looking. And let's do the same thing for this trunk. So go here. Cool. All right, so that's looking pretty good. So obviously it hasn't been done on the ground. That's why the shadow is still black. But the tree is looking a lot more natural and soft, but still has the cool hard normals, which give it that interesting look. So that's a pretty good start. The last thing we want to do is put our ambient occlusion map in here. So for each of these, since we're not really using texture in any way, we can just put our AO into the texture slot. So I'll put it here and here. All right. And that looks pretty good, except that I don't feel like these areas look that pretty. They're a little bit grungy looking. And we're not going for a grungy style. We're going for more of a natural, soft um, fantasy style. So. If I take this map, what's kind of cool is you don't always have to rebake things or change your render, render settings. Uh, sometimes you can just sort of adjust things in the map. So the first thing I'm going to do is a little bit of a blur, and that's just to sort of average out little artifacts here and there. And then I'm going to create another layer of just white. I'm going to make it 50% and flatten the layer. And that's basically just washing this out. And it might seem a little bit less interesting. But as you could see before, the ambient occlusion maps really go a long way. So they don't need to have this huge amount of contrast. So I save that. And then I'm going to go back to Unity. And you'll see it change. And now the ambient occlusion is a lot more subtle. But it's still definitely there defining kind of the look of things. So between these um, three, or I guess four different aspects, there's the hard normals, the sort of faceted look. There's the direct light with shadow. There's the marmoset shaders, and there's the ambient occlusion baked into the texture. And so far, that's what we've used to get our current look for the game. And we might explore it more, try different things, but we're pretty happy with this. So I hope all of these uh, sort of tips and tutorials can help you with your own game development projects. If you have any questions, just uh, write them in the comments and let me know what you think or any suggestions. Uh, by no means this is a perfect sort of workflow or look yet, but we're happy with how it's developed and, you know, look forward to doing more of it in the future. So thanks for your time, and yeah, thanks.